The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. In those three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14, we hear this very fascinating statement by that first angel. And it says there, saying with a loud voice, uh, let me go back, of course, to verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto those that dwell on the earth. Now notice the next verse is where I started. Saying with a loud voice, fear God. And give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. Fear God. Now, you'll hear a lot of people tell you that fear God means to reverence God. And it's not talking about being afraid of God. Well, it certainly includes reverence. But the word there is to be afraid. Afraid. Why? I struggle in my mind, how do you help people understand the fear of God when the Bible says, as you noticed in my opening, that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom? That sounds like something very good to me. The fear of God, that is wisdom, says Job. In another place, I think in Proverbs it says, and the fear of God is to hate evil. Is it a good thing to hate evil? Of course it is. So here in the gospel that goes to the entire world before Jesus comes, Included in that gospel is this sense of fear God. What does this mean? Do we go around just being afraid of God all the time? Thank the Lord we have the Lord Jesus who covers us. But God is, of course, not only our Creator. He's not only our Redeemer in the sense of sending His only begotten Son, but He's also the Judge of the universe. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, the fearful thing, he says, to fall into the hands of the living God, fearful in the sense, the hands of the living God in judgment. But if you're covered with Christ, as the Apostle John would say, love casts out fear. But if you're not covered with Christ, so the fear of God is simply this, means to take God seriously. When you take God seriously, You will take advantage of the Savior and you will hate sin. And that's the beginning of wisdom. What it really means is this, that God means what He says. Now we're going to talk about the destruction of the wicked and the lake of fire and all of those kind of things. And we'll talk about that more. But I want to go back to those seven last plagues. Again, we can't get into them in detail. But I want to give that quick overview just as I did a little bit the last time. Those, you have the seven churches, the seven trumpets, the seven, uh, I mean the seven seals and the seven trumpets. And the seven trumpets cover 2,000 years of Christian history from the time of John to Jesus coming again. And they are the judgments of God. And the seven last plagues, chapter 15, verse 1, says in the seven last plagues, the judgments of God were complete, meaning they're the finish. So these seven These seven terrible uh, trumpets, if you please, are to protect God's people. If God had not already put judgments in history, then the Christian church would have been wiped out long, long ago. So God often allows evil to correct evil. In other words, evil is its own worst enemy many, many times. Now that doesn't mean that God doesn't step in at times. But evil will correct evil often because it's selfish. Pagan Rome was destroyed in 66 years by the barbarians. And I think that's represented in those first, those first four trumpets destroying pagan Rome. And then papal Rome, as I mentioned last time, was checked by the rise of the Muslims And then, of course, as Protestantism came and the Reformation came, the power of the Muslims went down. But now, as the United States, this great Protestant nation, is now turning back to the papal dark ages, embracing the principles of the papacy, 
we now find once again the Muslims on the rise. And I shared some of that last time uh, with us. But the seven last plagues, as I mentioned, are part of the seventh trumpet. So there's seven trumpets and the seven plagues, I believe, are tied to the last trumpet, the seven trumpets. And I think that we are living in that seventh trumpet right now. So we're going to take a look at this seventh trumpet in Revelation chapter 11, verse 7 to 19. And we're reading here, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. In other words, the dark ages are over. God, Jesus is in the last part of the heavenly sanctuary in the Holy of Holies. And the issues on planet earth are wrapping up. We are headed toward one final crisis, stupendous crisis. And that's brought on by the mark of the beast, the rise of Babylon, which we'll get into in another program. Then it goes on to say, because you have taken your great power and reign. In other words, God is taking control in these final times. The nations are, were angry. What a description of our day. And your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged. When Jesus is in that ho most holy place, that's the time of judgment. Jesus is sorting out the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the tares. There's lots of people that claim to be Christian but the question is, are we really a Christian? Do we really trust Jesus with all our heart? Do we really love the Lord with all our heart? Are we willing and obedient by faith to do what He asks us to do? Do we keep His Ten Commandments, not on our power, but because we love Him and the Holy Spirit is in us, enabling us to carry out those commandments of God and based on the faith of Jesus? So there is a judgment going on that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints. So Jesus brings His reward with Him because there's a judgment going on now, an investigative judgment into the churches, all the churches that have my church, your church, whoever church you have, there's a judgment going on in heaven on those churches and on the Christians who sit in the pews of those churches and on the ministers and priests who lead those churches. And those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. And then the temple of God was opened and the ark of His covenant was seen in the temple. That's where the Ten Commandments are housed. And there were lightnings, noises, thunders, earthquake, and a great hail. So there is a reaction on earth to the picture that we see in heaven. Now it's very interesting that it says that the nations are angry. What a description of our world today. It seems like everybody is angry nowadays. Politicians are angry, both sides of the aisle. Uh, nations are angry. The weak are saying, I'm strong. Nations are angry. They're filled with selfishness. Many of them grinding down the poor, sacrificing babies on the altars of the lust of this world. I, I've been shocked at how far people will go with this. I mean, abortion is bad enough the way it was, and now people are, are embracing. Can you imagine embracing killing babies up to the time that they're getting ready to be born just because somebody doesn't want them? What kind of madness is that? It reminds me of the ancient Phoenicians. They sacrificed, they, they had these priests and priestess and they were into immorality and the practice of immorality in their worship and the babies were then sacrificed to their heathen gods. People are doing the same thing today. They may not say, well, it's Molech, but it's the gods of their lust and perversion. So we have, we have a world that's been filled, it's filled with murder today. We've seen the Nazis and what they did. Seventy million people lost their lives in World War II. And then you have Mayo he, in China. He killed 70 plus or minus millions of his own people. Stalin killed over 20 millions of his own people. And then we have, of course, ISIS today. and We can see the horrors of that. 
And you have, of course, these religious extremists. You hear foul mouth everywhere. You can hardly even go anywhere without somebody taking the Lord's name in vain or, or depreciating human intimacy. And it, it just people are just foul mouthed. And then you have all the massacres that are going on. I tell you, people are they're possessed with demons. And then the human trafficking, where they take these young girls from poor villages and, and trick them into sexual slavery. It's horrible. Constant wars and rumors of wars. Listen, evil is not going to escape. All of these things, the Inquisition and all of these per perpetrators of these kinds of things, judgment is coming. And God is also, on the other hand, going to reward His saints and those who fear God, who take Him seriously. So the temple of God is open in heaven. The Ark of the Covenant is open. And Revelation chapter 15, verse 5 says, After these things I looked, so it tied together the seventh plague, says the temple of God is open. And the seven last plagues opens with this, and after these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony, that's the same thing as the Ark of the Covenant, is open in heaven. So the Ten Commandments, once again, is a standard of right and wrong. The seven last plagues are poured out because people are in rebellion against God's Ten Commandments. They're in rebellion, and, these, and, they, and they've made life miserable for the God's faithful people. And so these seven last plagues are God's judgments. So um, out of that temple came seven angels having seven plagues clothed in bright linen and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls. Now earlier in chapter 5 you'll find these living creatures with golden bowls, but those bowls were filled with incense, which they, the Bible says is the prayer of the saints. But now, but now these bowls are filled with the judgments of God because God's people have prayed, they pled, and now people have made up their mind. Just like old ancient Pharaoh, so utterly stubborn, people have become stubborn against God. They've made up their mind. Not because God doesn't have great forgiveness in his heart, but because people really don't want forgiveness. They want their own way. They want God, the Ten Commandments done their way, and they're not going to obey God. And so now probation is closed, and these seven terrible plagues are going to be poured out, plagues of God's judgment, bowls that once were filled with the incense and prayers of the saints, now filled with the judgments of God. Listen. We shouldn't play around with human probation. All of us only have so much time in this world. And this time that you have to live, I don't care if you're young or you're old or you're in between, you should be using this time, this time to get ready for Jesus to come. Let me tell you, you don't want to, you don't want to squander that away. So that, the Bible says that um, the temple of God was filled with His power. And then these angels get ready to pour out these terrible plagues on people who are blaming God, blaming God for everything, for their troubles. But these seven last plagues are going to deliver God's people. So now we go to these seven last plagues that will deliver God's people and demonstrate His justice against those who have Push the mark of the beast. Very fascinating, these seven last plagues. So the first one says in Revelation 16, verse 2 So the first one poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon men who had the mark of the beast and who had worshiped his image. So those who have received the mark of the beast or accepted it are going to get this. Then this is not just people, religious people. This is going to include the atheists. They're not going to escape. They've accepted the mark of the beast because it was convenient. And there's many other people who've accepted it, maybe not because they believed it, but because they needed to work or they needed the economic advantages. Many Christians have accepted it because they didn't check out the Bible. They didn't test their, their clergy 
by the Scripture. And so they just took what the clergy told them, and they receive it. Pagans believe it, and they receive it because of the great many miracles that's been performed by this image to the beast that's been given breath to live. And so the second plague comes, Revelation 16, 3. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. So this is against the sea. I, not long ago I was in Panama, and someone very kindly took me to the Panama Canal. I'd never been, and it is an amazing thing to see these huge ships. They've They've constructed not too long ago another canal now to handle these larger ships. They're so large they had to have a new canal for them. It's amazing the tonnage that's coming through there, coming from Asia, sweeping into North America, into Europe. Uh, it, unbelievable amounts of cargo going through there. So the world is tied together globally through trade. People hope to get rich. You read the 18th chapter of Revelation, it talks about Babylon, and it talks about how the merchants, the sea merchants, weep because of the fall in Babylon because nobody buys their goods any longer. So let me, let me go down to this. So this shuts down trade is what it does. And everything that people depend on for luxury or for wants is put a stop to. You know, some people worry about, well, what am I going to do if I receive the mark of the beast and, you know, economically I get destroyed? Well, let me tell you this. In the end of time, everybody's going to get destroyed economically. Those who receive the mark of the beast certainly will. Now, they may not do it at first. God's people may suffer all of that economic hardship, maybe losing their lives and persecution. They may receive it first, but before it's all done and said, the whole world is going to be destroyed. It's, ec in its economics, on which the mark of the beast promised the world great plenty and great hope and, and great wealth, all that's going to be destroyed. So this plague is against that. So, they, they, um, so let's go to the, the next one, the third plague. Revelation chapter 16, verse 4 and 6. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And then the angel goes on to say, O oh Lord God, they deserve it, because they shed the blood of prophets and of your people. So God has, He's not not been asleep when he's seen all the blood of the martyrs. He's seen the Inquisition. He's seen the millions of people who've given up their lives for God's truth. And in the end of time, the people that refuse to receive the mark of the beast, many of them are going to lose their life. God understands everyone, and that blood cries out to God from the ground. And God is going to say to the world, you shed the blood of my people. You may... you." You, did, you treated them terrible and awful, and now you are going to drink that, this blood. Not their blood, but this blood. You know, Moses made Israel, after the golden calf, he ground up that golden calf and made them drink it. Why? Because it's the cup of justice, as it were. So in the fourth plague, Revelation 16, verses 8 to 9, then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with a great heat, and they blasphemed the God, name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent or give him glory. As we learned earlier when we talked about 666, we know that Sunday is the chief God of the pagans, and His special number is 666. We know how the Christian church, in its embracing of paganism, changed the Sabbath of the Ten Commandments from Saturday, the seventh day of the week, to Sunday, the first day of the week. Sunday is the day that the great pagan gods were honored on. You can find it in the Roman Empire, you can find it in ancient history. But it's also a symbol of the pagans who rejected God as Creator. And that's what Babylon and the ancient pagans were all about. That's the reason they didn't embrace the Ten Commandments. That's the reason they hated the Jewish people. It's because they did not want God being in charge. Like the evolutionists, they don't want a divine foot in the door. But there will be a divine foot in the door, for sure. 
And so now the sun, remember those charms, those charms from ancient Babylon with the 666 on one side and then the sun god on the other side, that it would protect them from these evil powers, but there's no protecting now. This sun is a terrible plague and men blaspheme God because of it. And then the fifth plague, a very interesting one, Revelation 16, verse 10 to 11, Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness. Now this is a plague poured out on the religious leaders, this religious leaders. So when this darkness comes, these people that are bent on destroying God's people are suddenly going to wake up. They're going to wake up and say, what? We've been on the wrong side of this. The clergy and the priest and everybody have told us that we were okay and we were doing God's will, but now we can see this plague of darkness and they're going to wake up. It's poured on the kingdom of the beast and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and they did not repent of their deeds. Now that fifth plague is tied into the sixth plague which is a very fascinating one as well. Revelation 16, verses 12 to 14. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now, I want to go back and say, we'll talk, we'll talk about that river Euphrates in just a moment and what that means. And I saw three unclean frogs. This one has a lot of symbolic language in it. It's very interesting. Three unclean spirits like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. That's that trilogy, the false trilogy again. For they are spirits of demons performing signs. Jesus said in the end of time they would perform miracles and deceive many people. Performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world and gather them to the battle of great of, of, um, of God Almighty, the great battle of God Almighty, the battle of Armageddon, so some of this takes place before that because all this deception before you ever get into the seven last plagues has been going on with these demons and they are performing all these wonderful signs, making fire come down from God out of heaven and the kings of the earth are deceived. Babylon, that woman also, another picture of the same thing and she deceives them by her charms. So the great deception all over the world and they're being gathered to that final battle, but the ways of the kings of the east are being prepared. Now let me just, I'll talk more about this in another subject, but let me just give you a little bit right now. Ancient Babylon set on a river, the Euphrates. In the book of Revelation, this new Babylon, chapter 17, sits on a river, but it's not a literal river, it's a river of people. You can read it in chapter 17 for yourself. And so, they deceive, these demons and this false trinity through the religious leaders deceive the world. And so the, it collapses. The support for Babylon collapses. You can read that in chapter 17. And so people are very upset and angry. And now these plagues prepare the way for the final approach of the kings of the east like Cyrus who came to overthrow ancient Babylon and he dried up the river and was able to overthrow Babylon. So this plague dries up the support of the cler for the clergy, all kinds of clergy that have deceived people. Listen, it's a very responsible thing to be a minister, to be a priest. It's a very responsible thing. And so this is dried up and people, they, they totally lose support. And then Jesus is coming with the final the final seventh plague. But there's some special instructions here, special instructions for the righteous, for those who are going through this. And he says here, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Unexpectedly, but I'm coming. Blessed is he who watches. That's the words of Jesus. He said, watch and pray. Stay on the alert. Blessed is he who watches. Are you watching? Are we praying? 
reading our Bibles every day? Are we in constant communion with God like Daniel was? Are we endeavoring in our life by the grace of the Lord Jesus and by the indwelling of Spirit to be obedient to the precious Savior, to follow His instructions? Are we watching? Are we praying? And then he goes on, Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. Where did those garments come from? Those garments are the garments that Jesus has given us. It's His righteousness. It's not our righteousness. But are we keeping those garments? Are we getting sin out of our life? Are we getting disobedience out of our life? We, we don't want to spoil these garments with more rebellion in our hearts, our life. Jesus blesses the person who keeps His garments. Now when the close of probation comes, my dear friends, we have got to be so settled in our mind and we've got to be so filled with the Spirit of God and so filled with the living Christ that we are not going to choose. By the grace of God, won't choose to sin between then and the coming of Jesus. So it says, blessed is the person who keeps his garments. In the end of time, sin is a spoiler. It's always been a spoiler. It's a horrible thing. Look at what it's done to the world. Look at what it's done to all of us. So he says, lest he walk naked and they see his shame, and lest somehow we don't keep our garments, we're not ready for the close of probation, we're not ready for Jesus to come, and then we will be put to shame. We lose our garment that Jesus has given to us. And the seventh plague simply says, The seventh angel poured out his bowl in the air, and there was a loud voice from heaven saying, It is done. And it pictures Babylon as a city that falls into three parts. It pictures a terrible plague of hell. And I, play, I think this is what we're seeing when Jesus comes. This hell precedes the coming of Jesus. Hell, the weight of a talent, 50, 60, 70 pounds, I don't know exactly. But there's nothing that can stand in the way of that. It's just destroying the armies of the earth who are now no longer listening to their clergy. They're just mad. They're mad at God and they hate His people. But these plagues are going to save God's people. They're going to deliver God's people. They're going to destroy Babylon who's persecuted God's people. But we must never forget the admonition. We must stay awake. We must stay on the alert. We must keep our garments white. We must get sin out of our life and put our trust every moment, every hour in our precious, incredible, marvelous Savior. <music> 